Shalom, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, online students, for uh, joining class. Welcome to our e-learning students as well who are listening to these lectures later on. Welcome to our in-person students. Good to have uh, Prince back in class after the break. Good to see you. Um, today we'll be studying Romans chapter five. We uh, uh, read through Romans chapter five uh, last week. Okay, uh, we'll move on. So in chapter four, uh, Paul is basically talking about righteousness through faith. And in Romans chapter five, he's talking righteousness through righteousness through grace. Okay, so grace and righteousness is what he's talking in chapter five. Faith and righteousness is what he has spoken in chapter four. Okay, so we'll begin uh, before we study chapter five in detail. We'll pause for a word of prayer. Can uh, one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Father, we come before you in this morning, Lord. We thank you so much for the new day in our life, my Father God. As we're going to start our class, my Father God, we need your wisdom and understanding to know more and learn more about you, my Father God. We thank you so much for everything, Lord. Lord, give us uh, the sound mind to listen and to equip the things, my Father God. Thank you for everything, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um... Chapter 4, we studied or we looked at how Paul says we receive righteousness by faith, okay, because of Christ. And uh, uh, because Christ was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification, okay. So, uh, he begins chapter 5, or this, this is actually a letter, so it's a continuation. So, he says, therefore, okay, therefore means what? Yeah, connected before, okay? Therefore, having been justified by faith, so he's, he's proved to the Jews and the Gentiles that we are justified by faith because of the example of, what are the two examples he gives? David and Abraham, basically talks about Abraham, okay? And so he says we've been justified by faith. And so what is the result of this justification? We have peace with God, okay? So as I said in the, uh, in the previous few classes, the word justified, justification, righteous, righteousness, all mean the same thing because they have the same root word, okay? And it means to be faultless, blameless. So it says we have been made justified or we have been made just as if we have never sinned. Okay, just imagine, because of God's, Jesus' righteousness that's been imputed upon us, God looks at us just as if we have never sinned. That not that amazing? You know, uh, it, it, when we think about it in human terms, in our, in our, even in our human mind, whenever we look at people, what first comes to our mind? The wrong things they have done? Okay, if they've not done any wrong things, then only the good things they have done comes to our mind. Or they could have done a million or thousand good things, but one wrong thing they do wipes out all of the thousand or hundred thing, good things that they have done. Okay, and that is so much a problem with, 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 with all of us. You know, even when we deal with children, they all, when they come for counseling, they're always saying, my parents did this, my parents said that, my parents, you know, treated me like this. So, and I say, look at the good things they have done. So when we look at the good things that we have, they have done, it kind of, you know, breaks, you know, one of bad, two wrong things or the way they have hurt us or able to see it in the light of the good things that they have done for us. Can you? Thank you. Yeah. No, no. So what does it So what does it mean to be justified by faith? 
Okay, what does it mean to be justified by faith? Or what are the outcomes of being justified by faith? So look at these verses. Can somebody read verses 1 uh, to verse 4 of chapter 5, please? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance and uh, perseverance, character and character hope. Amen. So he says, you know, what does it mean to be justified by faith? Or what is the outcomes of being justified by faith? So what is the outcome of being justified by faith? We have peace with God. He says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, which means we are one with God. We are not in fighting mode with God. We are not enemies of God. We are now friends of God. We have a good relationship with God and we are justified with God. So never think that God is angry with you. Never think that God is angry with us. Sometimes we think, you know, God is angry with me. That is why he's punishing me doing all of these things. Or sometimes we think God is upset with me. But what does the word of God says? God has, it says God has peace with us. That means we are in peace with God. Okay. And verse 2, he says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay. So here he mentions four outcomes of being justified. What are the four outcomes? The first one is peace with God. Second one, access by faith or into a standing in grace. What is the third one? A place of rejoicing, yes. And the fourth one? Rejoice in tribulation. So four outcomes of, um, of being justified that is mentioned here. Okay. The first one is we have peace with God which means we are one with God, we are reconciled to God. Okay, It means that we are no longer enemies of God. It means that God is not our enemy. We are not fighting with God. And also it says that we have peace with God. Okay, We can have peace with God and we can also have the peace of God. Two different things. We have peace with God and we have the peace of God. The peace of God um, uh, is uh, the fruit that we have as a result of our relationship with God. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And also we have peace with God means what? We are no longer enemies of God, but we are in right relationship with God. We are friends with God. Then it says we have access by faith into a standing of grace. What does it mean? That means we are in a position where we are highly favored by God. Amen. So this is all your spiritual identity and your blessings. As a result, because you have believed in Christ Jesus, you have been made righteous now, you have peace with God and you have the peace of God with you and nothing should shake that peace that you have of God and nothing can change that relationship that you have with God, the peaceful relationship that you have with God. And also you have an access of faith into a standing in grace. That means you are in a position where you are highly favored by God. Okay. Which means that we're entering into the standing in grace simply by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay. To be standing in grace means to God, we are loved as Christ is loved. Okay, what does it mean to be standing in grace? It means to God, we are loved as Christ is loved. Look at what John chapter 17 verse 23 says. Can somebody read that please? John 17, 23.
John 7:23 I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that they and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me how are we loved as christ has been loved can you imagine god the father loves us just the way he loves his only son how privileged we are the next one that is meaning of standing in grace is to god we are well pleasing look at what matthew chapter 3 verse 17 says can somebody read that please Matthew three seventeen, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, "This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased." Yes, so it is like the Father speaking over us, what He spoke over Jesus. So the Father is telling us, "Hey, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased." Okay. we are also fully accepted by god because of our standing in grace ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 ephesians 1:6 to to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved so we are fully accepted by god okay um and we are for the praise of his glory we are blessed beyond measure ephesians 1:3 can somebody read that we are blessed beyond measure ephesians blessed 1, be 3. the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ amen okay so we are blessed okay with every spiritual blessing we are also to god because of our standing in grace we are to god holy and without blame ephesians 1:4 okay. ephesians 1:4 just as he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world that he would be that we would be holy and without blame before him in love amen So we were chosen in him before the foundations of the world so that we can be holy without blame uh before him in love and also the we are before God we are faultless unaccused and with no condemnation Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 This includes you who were once far away from God you were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions at now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of christ in his physical body as a result he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault amen so here it says that we were once alienated from god we were once his enemies now we have been brought to him you know and uh, so we are reconciled to god and we are holy and blameless above reproach in his sight amen okay we are also qualified okay uh, look at what colossians chapter 1 verse 12 says giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light yes we are qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light okay so there is nothing more that we can do to add to all of these things in our own efforts except that we have received this freely by grace through faith what should we do what do you think we should do love him and thank him yes you need to embrace it accept it expect it to work in your life embrace this and walk worthy of this okay that is very important okay so therefore all that we do how we relate to god how we face the devil and all that we do in christian ministry actually flows out of this standing in 
grace. Amen? Okay, we flows out of the standing in grace without, and we can do this without any guilt and shame because he has qualified us. We are without fault, unaccused, no condemnation. We are holy without blame. Okay, we are blessed beyond measure. We are well pleasing to him. We are loved as Christ is loved and we are fully accepted by him. Right? So when the world looks at you, they will always look at you with your weaknesses, what you have done, what you shouldn't have done, your failties, your faults. Look at you, you're studying in Bible college, look at your lifestyle, how you're looking, how you're dressing, how you're, you know, uh, speaking, how you're acting, you know, all of those things people can accuse you and condemn you. But remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what we need to do is we need to not cannot achieve all of this in our own efforts all we do is you know we have to honor god for all that he has done walk worthy of him and you know we can relate to ministry relate to our life and all that we do even when we face the devil the devil always reminds us of our weaknesses always reminds us about our past mistakes what we have done okay so we can go ahead knowing what god has done for us on the cross and what he's purchased for us and who we are in that standing of grace before God. Okay. So the reason we live holy lives, the reason we renounce sin, ungodliness, we work hard, we pers pursue excellence, we make sacrifices, we take risks, is to not earn anything from God. Why? Because he's given us already everything that we need. Okay. But why should we live a life that is without sin? Why should we renounce sin? Why should we not live in ungodliness? Why should we live in holiness? Why should we pursue excellence? Why should we work hard? Why should we make sacrifices? When none of this is important, it's not by works, but by grace. But why, why is all of this important? Sorry? To steward what God has given to us, okay. Yes, to express our gratitude and our thanks and saying, God, we desire to honor you for all that you have given to us. The way you have blessed us, you've given us the best and out of that, your love for us, God, we want to do this out of our love for you and we want to we desire to honor you okay so yes we already know our standing in grace we already know that none of these works are going to earn us any grace because we've already received everything by grace and we already know that we are empowered by his grace but when we do all of this we're just saying god i'm extending my honor to you for what you have done for me i'm showing you my love and i'm doing this for your glory okay now the third thing that we receive because uh, of being justified the outcome of being justified the third thing is that we are in a place of rejoicing okay we are rejoicing for what what he has already done okay yes the good things that he has planned for us okay the good things that he's going to release upon us, okay? The glory that he has kept for us, because he says we are rejoicing for the hope of the glory of God, okay? So we have this hope, we will share in God's glory, but this includes, part of this includes what, you know, his presence in heaven, but already we have received from his grace and the gifts that he has given to us. So there's already things that we can enjoy. We have peace with God. We have the grace of God. We have the right standing with grace. But there is more that God has kept for us. And we are rejoicing in the hope that we will receive that more as well. Amen. The fourth outcome is rejoice in tribulation. What is, why do we rejoice in tribulation? Why do we rejoice in tribulation? Okay, even though we go through tribulations, we have this hope. Okay. 
build our faith, okay? Paul says, take joy in the trials that you go through. Is it easy to take joy in trials when you're going through trials? <laughs> it's trust in the Lord and His Word, yes. What does it say? Why should we take joy in tribulations? Why should we rejoice in tribulations? Huh? Okay. the mic because our online students will not be able to hear. I'm happily saying yes, yes, and <laughs> yeah. Maybe be, uh, like because we are being his witness, that's why we are going through this. So we just rejoice okay. because we are bearing his name. Okay. What is the outcomes of it? Look at what it says. What does tribulation do? It brings about perseverance. I mean, even in James, it talks about uh, similar. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of all kinds. Because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And then if, if that has its perfect work, then you would be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Yes. So it's never in vain. Because it always does something wonderful in our inner being and our character. Yes. So that's why. Thank you, Nina John, for um, uh, you know sharing from James. Yes, J uh, James says, take joy in the trials. Why? Because that will help you to grow strong in your faith. And when you have come out, you will come out like gold. You will be mature, fully perfect, and fully mature. Okay. So that is what uh, James writes to us. And here also Paul says, glory in tribulations okay knowing that tribulations produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope okay so when we go through difficulties and you know trials we need to rejoice because that is going to make our faith more stronger in god depend on god for to see breakthroughs to see openings and also that it's going to help us to become fully mature people Okay, and also produces perseverance in character and character hope. Okay, so that is what um, uh, he says here. Okay, and um, so even when we go through hard times, we can still be happy when things are difficult and hard. We are not, you know, shouldn't be down, dejected, disappointed because we glory in tribulations, knowing that it's going to build, develop endurance. That means it gives us the ability to stay on course, to run our race, to fight our uh, battles with the strength of God. And also it's going to produce character and character hope. Okay. So mm, it uh, basically when we stay on our course, you know, we are people who are being developed. Okay. Uh, we are people who are becoming people of hope. You know, we can look at the positive side of things even when going through tribulations, okay? So hope is an expression of being strong in our character, okay? This means that, you know, uh, people who um, have been, um, you know, uh, tried and proved, they've been tested, you know, that their, their faith has been tested. They have come through like gold. They are strong. They are pure. You know, they are perfect. So even in difficult situations, we can still have hope. And what is the hope going to do for us? It's not going to disappoint us. Okay. We will not be disappointed because we know and the hope will become a reality one day. Okay. And here we also see that, you know, um, in verse, um, verse uh, is it verse 6? Can somebody read verse 5, please? Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Yes. Why can we have the love, uh, 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 hope? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts. Okay, so right now, the love of God has been poured into our hearts, and we're expressing the love of God that has been poured out into our hearts. 
Okay, so that is what he continues to say in verses uh, five to verse eight. So can somebody talk, uh, read five to verse eight, please? The love of God that has been uh, has for the, has for us. The love God has for us. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for us, for the ungodly. For certainly, for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. So in tribulation, what kind of a person I should be? A person full of hope. Why should I be that person full of hope? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts and I can experience the love of God. Okay, So the love of God has been poured out into our hearts Okay, and so we are experiencing now the love of God because it's been poured out into our hearts here, here and now. Okay, so the Holy Spirit who enables us to personally experience the love of God and also to walk in the love of God. So who helps us to experience the love of God? Is the Holy Spirit who helps us to personally experience the love of God and also to walk in the love of God. God okay um, it's also that you know we are able to love others okay if God's love has been poured out into our hearts not only do we experience that love but I'm able to turn around and say hey if God has loved me I can also love others as well okay and if God has loved me to this measure okay that I experience the love of God that measure I can extend his love to others. So the ex how much love can you extend to others? Yes, how much you experience the love of God in your hearts. To the extent that you experience the full measure of the love of God in your hearts, to that extent you are able to uh, extend God's love to others. Okay. So if God could love us in spite of our falls and our weaknesses and our mistakes okay the same love that has been poured out in our hearts which we experience personally makes us more than conquerors in difficult situations amen and gives us this conviction that nothing can separate us from the love of god which paul later on talks in romans chapter 8 the same love we extend to other people as well, so it's important that we experience the love of God in our hearts to the extent that we are full of his love, to the extent that we um, know his love, to the extent that we feel his love, to the way extent that we experience his love, to that extent we can share that love with others. If we have not experienced that full extent of God's love, we can never love other people we can never extend that love to other people okay um, and uh, we can know that even in difficult situations we can more be more than conquerors and nothing can separate us from the love of god why when the love of god is being poured into our hearts, okay and when the love of god is being poured into our hearts we will never look for you know love from anywhere else because we are so full so soaked we are so content that even when people don't love us even when people reject us even when people uh, you know um, use us in our lives we are still able to love them and extend God's forgiveness why because we are being soaked with God's love we are full of God's love so I think it's a good prayer to pray every day and say God help me to understand your love for me help me to experience the full extent of your love. God, just soak me in your love. Or let me just bask in your um, love. Okay? 
So this verse 5, which we read, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now this can be understood both as the love of God being poured into our hearts, creating in us an experience, an intimate personal knowing of the love that God has for us. Okay, it can bring us to that place of intimate, personal knowing of and experiencing God's love for us. And it can also be understood as the love of God being poured into our hearts, giving us the capacity to love others as he has loved us. So you see how important the love of God is for us to know that love, experience that love and feel that love is only then we can be able to reciprocate that love to God himself and also love other people, okay? And we see that later on in chapter, uh, chapter 8, Paul describes how powerful this love is, okay? How powerful the love that God has for us. And so he points us to the cross as a place where God demonstrated this great love for us. And he says, all this is possible because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay. So he says, that is all this is possible because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And he says, God demonstrated his love for us when? While we were still sinners. Another famous verse, Christ died for us. Okay. So when did God love us? Not when we are good, when we are holy, when we accepted him. When um, we believed in him, it was even when before that, when we were sinners, that God demonstrated his love for us. And we know how God demonstrated his love for us on the cross. Okay. Any questions so far? Anything anyone wants to say? Uh, before you told like one sentence, devil reminds our past. So, like, how he, he will remind our past? Okay. Um, devil reminds us of our past and brings in a lot of shame, guilt, and condemnation. Right? So, he'll say, like, for example, now, we all know some of the things that we have done in the past. Right? Maybe in our childhood days, in our teenage days. You know, we've gone away. We've lived worldly lifestyle. We've done things. And God, we've encountered God. And, uh, you know, we've come to Bible college. And when we go back and we're preaching and teaching, what will people say? Look at this boy or this girl. You know, they, they did this, this, this. They behaved like this. They, be, you know, they were like this. And now they're standing up and preaching to us. Okay. Or sometimes the devil will say, hey, don't preach. You know, you look at your own life, how you were, how you are, Right. Uh, you know, suppose you're going for, um, I, I know that's very challenging, especially, especially when you're going to teach in a, in a, a, you know, you're teaching a Bible college class or you're going to preach somewhere or you're going to, you know, speak in a Bible study, something happens at home. It triggers off your anger, your disappointment, you're upset, you say things and then you're going, you're so upset, you're going. And, uh, or you're leading, you're supposed to lead prayer in the church, you're supposed to lead worship in the church, or you're supposed to do something. The only, what is the devil telling you? Oh, what did you just not do? So unworthy, such a sinner. Now you're going to lead worship. You think God was going to accept your worship? You know, what a, um, uh, you know, uh, now you're going to go there and stand, hallelujah, praise the Lord, preach, teach, you know, sing. Uh, you know, you're fooling everybody, you're fooling yourself, you know, you think God is going to be pleased with what you're doing? So that can be the devil who is speaking all this in your mind. Yes, you've done something wrong, so what do you do? What do you do when you've done something wrong? Yeah, you just say, God, you know, I got angry, I was got upset, I'm very sorry, um, uh, help me to change things. You might say sorry to the person or you can just reconcile and say, hey, I didn't mean what I said, you know, I just got upset, I shouldn't have, you know, just deal with it, go on and, and minister. Because of that, many people have said, you know, I'm unworthy to serve God because of my 
life, what I have done. Hey, that's the past. God has dealt with it. He's taken it away. You know, there's no more guilt. There's no more shame. There's no more condemnation. That does not mean that we continue to do things that are wrong and, you know, just live our lives as in well we please and say, no, no, grace, greater grace, greater grace. No. We say that we have to live godly lives. We have to repent. We have to live holy lives. We have to walk worthy of the Lord. But yet we fail times. We do things. We just repent and cover it with the blood of the Lamb and just ask God to use us. I'm like, <laughs> wow, the, the, it's a mind, right? It's come. So like in demonology, uh, we learn like devil cannot play with our minds. The, he cannot control our mind. Cannot control our minds. The devil cannot control your mind yeah. unless you give him access. Yes, All that what the devil does, he yes. just plants one thought. Yeah, so like that is enough. That's our. Th uh, I'm not unworthy. Like uh, I did this. Now how can I did worship? That's our mindset or like what, ma'am? Yeah. So you are actually taking that thought further. The devil has put a thought in your mind. Yeah, the battle is raging in the mind, no? That is why we need to renew our minds every day. Yeah, it only just puts a thought. It's I'm not saying it gives you the desire. We are when we are when are we tempted? When we are drawn away by our own desires, selfish desires, and we yield into it, and that becomes sin. But the devil can put a thought. It's your choice whether you discard that thought or you keep the thought and think about that thought so the devil can say hey you're no use you can't speak you can't lead worship you are unworthy so what do you do you think you're unworthy and say hey i'm not leading worship i can't do it or you're saying god has i can do all things through christ who strengthens me i have a right standing in grace and because of that i am faultless without any guilt shame no condemnation you know and um, i'm loved by god and I'm qualified by him and I'm just going and doing it. So he can put a thought. But you are, it, it's your choice whether you talk, take that thought further and or you deal with it, you condemn it and you break it. So God has given us weapons. That is why the battle is in the mind. That is why the, then if, there was no battle in the mind, then why should God give us the armor of, you know, the the uh, the helmet? Yes. What is the helmet of salvation? Not just they're saved. Means you're standing in who you are in Christ as a result of being saved. Um, I'm, uh, to uh, verse 5, like, no, oh, verse for rejoice in tribulations or even uh, connecting verse to it, oh, what James says, like, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. So, like, what the trials here, like, mean certainly, because we know God is not a God who punishes when we did wrong or he is not, he won't allow sicknesses when we look through, uh, the nature of God through Christ Jesus, we know it's not God's nature to give, you know, disease or so, put you put us under some things to test us to make us go through trials. But also, uh, when we there are some people, they take this like trials can also be a sickness from God because God is testing us and how we can say. And also, uh, within verse 1, we have seen, like, we are not enmity with God. Like, we have the peace with God. But, and also you mentioned, like, we did some wrong, so God is angry with us and God punishes us. We say all this from the New Testament and let people know, but people also talk about from the Old Testament, where David also writes sometimes, like, you have punished me or... You have broke my leg like that. Uh, David also wrote. So, what? How we can like stand to it? Because people take from it, and they will also ask like, so does God change it now from old times? So how we can say like, no, God is not the God who gives diseases to test and make us go through trials. 
Okay, good question. So here in this context, firstly, uh, Romans chapter 5 verse um, uh, 3 and verse 4, when he's talking about trials, he's writing to the church at Rome. So when you interpret it, you interpret in that context where we know that the church's Rome is being severely persecuted by the emperor and all. And he's heard about their persecution and how strong he is in their faith. So he's talking about that here. Okay, so that is one thing. And the other thing is when you're talking about trials, we go through various trials in life. Now, the trials in life is not brought about by God. It can be brought about by our own wrong, sinful, disobedient action. Trials can also be because of we live in a sinful world and there are people around us who bring about, you know, through their actions in our lives, you know, we can go through trials, difficulties because of what they do in our lives. Also because of what Satan can do. For example, in Paul's life, you know, the thorn in his flesh was not something from God. It was something buffeting from Satan. Okay. So Satan was bringing that. Why was Satan doing that? So that he can be, so that it be a hindrance from him to do the ministry. Okay. But what does God say? My grace is sufficient for you. So whether you go through persecutions, whether you go through trials, hardships and difficulties because of the consequences of your own sin or what people do towards you or, you know, because of their hatred, their enmity, their jealousy. Um, what is God telling us? What should be our attitude? Take joy, glory, because that is going to make your faith strong. It's going to help you to persevere, endure, and it's going to help you come out full and mature okay but in the context of what you're saying about when people say god brings sickness you know when 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 paul says you know um, uh, when god sent those fiery serpents uh, when god you know divided the earth and you know uh, and people fell in and you know they died god sent plagues and how can god do all of these things so we learned in the healing and deliverance class that you always have to interpret all of these scripture in the light of the rest of scripture and also interpret it in the light of the nature of God. Because who God is, he never contradicts his word and his actions. His actions and his word always are in alignment with his nature. So when you look at all of these things, how do you... Uh, uh, interpret it. We know God is not the author of sickness and disease. So when, say, God sent um, uh, evil spirit on Saul, God sent the fiery serpents, God sent the plagues, then we interpret it in the sense that God cannot send all of these things because he does not have it. But it means that it, they are just out of the spiritual covering. And when they're outside the spiritual com covering, they're open to the elements of this world the engaging with the elements of this world we live in a fallen world and also satan is all out to steal kill and destroy to bring in his you know um uh, uh, the things that he does. So even in the early church, we see that, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, when things happened, you know, they just struck down and dead for a for a, a lie that they said, you know, or Zechariah was struck dumb. Why? Because when there's a period of greater glory, when people are seeing the greater manifestation of the glory of God, there is zero tolerance to sin. Because they're seeing they're in a period of greater manifestation. They know there's zero tolerance to sin. That means God judges sin. Okay. And so that is why they are facing the consequences of their um, sin. But also that serves as an example for others to learn. Also, when people are outside the spiritual covering, they're engaging with the elements of this world, they're uh, uh, with Satan and what does he's doing. It reminds them of the love of God. That is why Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Yes, God is a God of wrath. He judges sin, but he's also long-suffering. He's also patient. He's forbearing. And the goodness of God leads to repentance. So when they're facing all of these things, they remember, hey, God was so good to me. They come back and they repent and back in the spiritual covering and they experience the blessings and their right standing in grace. 
Anyone else? Good questions? Okay, there are no questions. Then we move on to verses 6 to verse 11. So here Paul is focusing on Christ's death for us and he is focusing on the cross. So can somebody please read verses 6 to 11, please? For when we are we were still without strength in due time christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die but god demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath to him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Amen. So here we uh, see in these verses, you know, uh, uh, like to emphasize three things. First thing is that we were without strength. Okay. Later on in this chapter, we will talk about how, you know, we move to a place of strength where Paul says we are reigning in life. And so Paul is here building up a contrast. He's saying here that, you know, we were without strength, but later on in this chapter, he goes on to talk how we come to a place of strength where we are reigning in life. So he's kind of building up a con contrast. So he says, when we were without strength, how are we? When we are without strength, how are we? How are we when we are without strength? We are weak. We are powerless. When were we without strength? What is this time he's talking about? When we were in sin, yes. We were slaves of sin. We were in slavery to many things. So this was our condition. We were in a stage without any strength. Then he says, at the right time, Christ died. Now, when did Adam and Eve sin? How many years before this Paul writing that Adam and Eve had sinned? Almost 4,000 years. Okay, so we can say, hey, if 4,000 years, why did Christ have to wait that long? If Adam and Eve had sinned, immediately if he had found that, he had brought about that solution, he would have executed his plan of salvation. Jesus would have done on the cross the very next day that Adam and Eve had sinned. If Christ had come and died on the cross, then only two, then only two people had to be saved and redeemed and mankind would have been saved from sin but it says here that god waited for 4000 it doesn't say here but you know you know in the fullness of um, uh, of time it says okay it says um, uh, when yeah when we were still with us in due time christ died for the ungodly Okay, so the right time, God died for the ungodly. So he God waited for 4,000 years. And we say, why did God we have to wait for 4,000 years? Why did people have to suffer? Where, why did people have to face the consequences of sin for 4,000 years? Yet scripture tells us that at the right time, Christ died. For us, 4,000 years in our mind is a long time. Okay, But for God, it is the right time. It's a due time. The right time okay so we cannot understand everything we cannot understand god's timing but we can say what he has revealed for us in his word at the right time he has done the right thing for us amen okay we stop here um uh, is it okay if i post the first assessment we have first finished the first four chapters uh, post the assessment next monday is that fine online students is it fine for you all Yes, no, next Monday, is it okay? Okay, Chaya. What about the others? Nina, Shivkumar is next Monday, fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Shivkumar. Okay, I'll post the assessment, the first assessment um, next Monday. 
the first four chapters. Okay. I'll mention everything in the. Oh, you want the weekend? Or do you want uh, the, the uh, sorry to take your time? The online, the in-person students are saying that they want it on a on a weekend, so they have more time. Is is that okay for you all, or is Monday fine? Okay, I'll just. Um, Okay, I'll just confirm that. Maybe we can discuss it in the stream page and we can see how it goes. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Have a blessed day.